Good morning, church. How's everybody feeling? Pretty good? Yeah. We're just warming up here a little bit, but uh, we'd like you to just sing this chorus with us before we take it out. Is that okay? We know a lot's going on in the world, right? need you to sing what's going on with us, okay? You ready? Let's give another hand for Ms. Shalila Settles and friends. Well, good morning again and welcome to all my siblings here at Westminster and those who are visiting us on Zoom today. We are delighted to welcome our guest preacher today, Dr. Jeff Nickel, to the pulpit born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Alexandria, Virginia. Dr. Nickel received his BS degree in electrical engineering, physics, and mathematics. He also received a PhD in theoretical physics from MIT. More recently, he earned a master's in religious studies from the Howard University School of Divinity. He has published two books on church history and theology titled Augustine's Problem and Potence and Grace and Strange and Godly Fruit, Toxic Theology. He is the proud father of two children, has been blessed with four grandchildren. He co-facilitates Westminster's, Westminster's Sunday adult, adult education class with his lovely wife, spiritual leader, and educator, parish partner, Reverend Dr. Alice Bellis. We are fortunate to have this dynamic duo in our midst. We also welcome back Shirley Settles and friends who lead us in song this morning. So thank you. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child along way from home sometimes i feel like i'm almost gone Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Alone. From home, true believer, true believer, true believer, true. Believer, true 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 believer,
Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a Long, long way from home. The scriptures for today begin with the book of Job, chapter 38, 1 to 7. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Second is from Mark 15, uh, 33 to 34. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This comes from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night, but find no rest. As you saw in the introduction, uh, I am uh, very fortunate to be the husband of Alice Bellis. And, and during the uh, 20 years of our being together, uh, I have often been her editor of her books, her papers, and her servants. Uh, she uh, persuaded me to go to Howard one afternoon about eight years ago when uh, I'd had a hard day at work and she made a cocktail and possibly relaxed by the cocktail. I started, I started going on about something and I do go on about things. And, and she said, do you realize that you're preaching? So she decided that I ought to go to Howard and uh, actually learn something. I'd already published my first book before then. And uh, the second book is, is an evolution of my master's thesis at Howard. But I have never given a sermon. And... Therefore, there is risk in this for both you and for me. <laughs> because with these texts, I've chosen one of the most difficult uh, topics to have a sermon on. What can we expect of God in a world of so much pain and, and so much grief? Uh, our first text is from, from Job is uh, God's speech from the whirlwind. It goes on for chapter after chapter. Uh, 
God is chiding Job for Job having the temerity to question the universe, to, trust, to question the justice of the trials that Job has undergone. The second is, of course, Jesus' cry from the cross of abandonment. The third is just to show where, that Jesus was quoting something. He wasn't making that up. It is thought that he's quoting from Psalm 22, uh, where the uh, psalmist is also asking, where is God? I cry for you night and day. Now, if Alice was giving this sermon, it would be a different sermon. Uh, she would point out um, what is likely to be the case that the book of Job was uh, part of a theological tension. It was a battle uh, a, written sort of against Jeremiah and Lamentations and its use of a primitive Deuteronomy-based theology about fate and fortune. And she would have noted that Psalm 22, which starts in that note of despair, ends on a note of trust. This is not going to be that sermon. I'm going to take these texts as uh, being illustrations of real despair. Okay. Um, you can consider this sort of being a, a pre-Lenten uh, commentary, a midrash, on the suffering of the cross and on human suffering. Because, as Isaiah should have said, we are all people of sorrow, acquainted with grief. We have all been motherless children. I'm going to start, however, sort of more in my normal vein with a theologian, Simone Weil, uh, 1909 to 1943. In her short life, she was amazingly influential. Her take was both mystical and metaphorical and magical and mysterious. When she considers these texts, she emphasizes that the cry from the cross was not merely a quotation. It represented a moment of absolute forsakenness. She argues that only if Jesus felt absolutely forsaken at that moment would the cross have meaning. She calls this most intense of despairs, malheur in French. We normally translate that as affliction in English, which again doesn't carry the weight that she intend that you know in English uh, or French. If the soul, she says, is crushed by uh, affliction, it can lose the ability to love God, and that is hell. But if the soul can survive that affliction, then the soul will be given the same vision that Job was given of the divine majesty. She says that affliction is like a is a, is an infinite force applied to our finite soul, a sharply pointed nail hammered by a giant hammer. And if that if the soul were to survive that, it uh, would be, she says, quote, nailed to the center of the universe because the finite and the infinite meet at the intersections of the cross. If you want to know more about Simone Weiss, there's actually a book review in today's Washington Post uh, of a republishing of some of her work. She was uh, incredibly influential for her short life. Uh, but always uh, a little odd. Uh, the, uh, her friends called her a Martian. So 
There's a lot to unpack in Simone Weil, so we're not going to do any more about her today. Uh, the intellectual questions are more about uh, the 10 o'clock period where we talk about these things. Um, today, I want to talk about that level of visceral pain, that pain that Jesus felt, the pain that sometimes we all have felt. Uh, this is not really developing out of that course, but about some recent events in my own life uh, that partly have shown the, that our pretensions to philosophy and theology are overrated. Uh, many of you may know about Alice's colleague, Dr. Gay Byron, who suffered two cerebral aneurysms uh, not long ago. Uh, Howard rallied behind her, and there was a prayer vigil held for her uh, by Zoom, of course. Everything's by Zoom. And on that, all of the Harvard Howard uh, faculty uh, you know, had their piece. Alice had her quote from the Psalms, and everyone spoke. But several people spoke about God being a God of miracles. And the people on the Zoom call were enjoined uh, to pray for a miracle, to reverse the decision of the doctors, because after all, God can do anything. Well, I was on that Zoom call, and I fell into an abyss. Alice can witness that it took me three days to stop weeping. But I wasn't weeping for Gay. My nephew, 50 years ago or more, was born with a heart defect. He was in open heart surgery a few hours old. We were all waiting for him to grow a little, you know, get a little bigger, uh, so that the final, some final adjustments could be made. But at the age of two and a half, there was an emergency, and he died. I was in graduate school, I think, and was visiting my mother, I don't think because of the surgery, it was just happenstance, and I can remember uh, screaming. Uh, the prayer vigil for Gay had reopened all my wounds and uh, revealed the depth of the anger that I still held against God. Before I go on, I should say that this discussion is a dangerous one. It may be dangerous for some of you here. If you are currently experiencing this kind of grief, please feel free to withdraw. When I was nine years old, my father was taken ill quite suddenly. Uh, in the hospital one night, my mother was maintaining her private vigil and a feeling of calm came over her. And she felt it was like a divine grace descending upon her. And then that night, my father died. My mother felt betrayed, but she eventually decided that that moment of calm had been a reassurance that she would be able to continue and raise my sister and myself. I was going to add a third story about a friend and colleague who lost a child abruptly, but also who found a way to reconcile 
that cruel and sudden death. And that happened a couple of years ago. And right now, she is in the anniversaries of her loss. And it doesn't feel right to talk any more about it. Because there, her pain radiates from her. And I can feel it here. Gay's vigil showed me that I was neither reconciled nor healed. As Martin Buber says, one can endure pain, but not the God who sent it. Simone Weil was wrong. God cannot possibly want us to be afflicted in this way. She wanted to say that suffering, even affliction, even at that level of the cross, was the path to God. And I guess part of me rejects a God that would require that path. So the title of the sermon was, What Can We Expect From God? I don't know. How should we handle grief and pain like this? Well, I certainly don't know, because I have not handled a loss of 50 years ago or the loss from nearly 70 years ago. We can hope for, but we cannot expect miracles. We will welcome comfort, but comfort may not come. What are we left with? We can ask questions. Consider Job's story. At the end of the whole thing, Job gets new children, new servants, new flocks. The story doesn't actually say how Job's wife felt about this, nor does it explain that there was, whether there was any compensation given to the families of his servants who were all slain. Auschwitz survivor Elie Wiesel, when he was in Auschwitz, every day saw a thousand missed miracles as a thousand people went to the crematoria. He would have liked a different answer, a different ending to the book of Job. He thinks Job should have still questioned God's role in the death of his children and his wife and his servants. Wiesel thinks that Job, if he had been a historical character, that Job was not showing what a human being would actually do there. Job was not reconciled to these events, but he knew he could not make God answer him. And neither can we. I, I can't make God answer for my father's death or Nicholas's death or the death of my friend's child. If we cannot say what we can expect of God, we perhaps should ask a different question. What is expected of us? What should we expect of ourselves? The prophets, in I think 30 times in the Hebrew Bible, mention the plight of the widows and orphans and enjoins the people to take care of them. Now the widows and orphans would have pres presumably have preferred some miraculous intervention that left them their husbands and fathers. But absent that, the responsibility is ours, say the prophets. Wiesel said in his essay on Job, Job personified man's eternal quest for justice and truth. He did not choose resignation. He was shut up, but he didn't, didn't agree. Thus, Wiesel goes on, 
He did not suffer in vain. Thanks to him, we know that it is given to man to transform divine injustice into human justice and compassion. I would say that it, what God omits to do, we must provide. We have guidance in this. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And having spent a lot of time reading theologians, I know that last one is the hardest. Because we all have one of our perhaps innate weaknesses is pride. And we like to think we have the answer to all questions. Grief is one of the ways that we learn and relearn that we do not. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, is often read as uh, uh, an apocalyptic tale about the end of the world and, and final judgment. Here the sheep go to heaven, the goats go to hell. But I don't think that's what it's about, at least not entirely. What Matthew 25 says is don't worry about your own salvation. Don't claim to know what God says or does, but work for the salvation of others. That we understand, and that's our responsibility to do. We must provide the miracles that God does not do, that God does not, to the limits of our understanding, our strength, and our abilities. We must all. We must all strive to be the hope someone needs. We must all strive to wrap them in our love. There may be some piece of that in that for those of us who are mourning, even if our griefs always return. But that is what we are told to do, and that we don't need theology to understand. The examples given in this so far have been personal griefs, where individuals uh, lost someone, uh, and God did not meet our hopes and, ex and expectations, our dreams. On this first Sunday of Black History Month, we need to remember the deaths that have not only been personal, but also have political and social significance. God did not intervene to save Martin or Malcolm, Goodman, Shaney, and Schwermer, or Trayvon, or George, and innumerable others. Instead of worrying about what we expect of God, we must go beyond giving personal comfort. We are expected to witness with love, compassion, sure, but also with political and social action. Amen. Amen. Ashe.
live in peace.